Um, our first guest is going to talk to us about a lot of things that he's doing, what God has placed in his heart to do. Um, he has a book that's entitled Proof of the Afterlife, The Conversation Continues. And it, he was talking to us a little bit about uh, he was basically on life support, um, had an illness, and, and was dead for about 30 minutes. And in that time, he was able to um, see what was after on the mm -hmm. after, on the other side. Mm -hmm. But he also deals with homeless people, and he has a ministry extraordinaire. Please welcome to the show, Brother Gary Joseph. Brother how Gary, are you? how are you doing, Gary, sir? Good. God bless you, boy. Thanks Good. for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I, I, you know, we were talking a little bit about um, being on the other side, seeing some of the things um, of God. Yeah. Um, explain to our viewers exactly what transpired and what happened after that. It was uh, in 2005, they uh, had diagnosed me with a large tumor in my throat, and the surgery was in August. And about two or three weeks after surgery, um, the area that they had operated on had some complications, and uh, all of a sudden, I, I was, uh, I, went, I went into like a cardiac arrest, um, didn't have time to call anybody, it just basically died on the spot. It was the night of uh, September 26, 2005, and uh, I remember that the clock in the room said 1.15 in the morning, so I, I, I know that I was basically gone for a half hour and my heart stopped, and the next thing I knew, I was before the presence of God. He was um, shielding himself behind a gray screen, and the screen was very thin, and little pieces of glory light oh. were bursting through the screen. And every time there would be a burst of his glory and his light, it would be uh, terrifying, and I, uh, it, because it was so powerful, his glory, and I kept, thinking, I hope he doesn't remove the screen because uh, I, I knew how powerful he was coming out and just those little pieces of white light. Mm -hmm. And so I kept saying glory to God in the highest, peace to your people on earth. And I, I kept singing that to him and saying that. Mm -hmm. And then he started to talk to me about some things that I think people now may be interested in knowing. He said that he, he's our father and that he was my father and that he loves us all very much, that we're his children, and that I'm his child. And he talked a lot to me about uh, my earthly father, who, interesting enough, we didn't get along very well when he died. So it was kind of interesting that the God the Father took some time to talk to me about being my father. And he said, you know, that I expect uh, responsibility from you and duty from you to do your duty um, because I'm your father. And it was kind of like he gave me a pep talk. And uh, it was right after that that I was in blackness. And I, uh, after the, the father left me, and then in the blackness, I called out to the Lord. And Jesus came on a big white cross the size of a football field. He came down off the cross, picked me up, hugged me. And I kept saying to him, uh, Psalm 84, a day in your presence, Lord is better than thousands elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And as he hugged me, uh, people say, well, what's that like? Well, it's hard to describe, but when your mom hugs you or your dad hugs you, and then multiply that times millions uh, and millions. And I, I kept saying to him, uh, a day in your presence is better than thousands elsewhere. And I really thought that I was dead and that I was going to stay with him. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body. And the clock in the room said a quarter to two. So I had been dead exactly 30 minutes uh, to the minute. Wow. And then my whole life changed. Uh, I had been in business. I was doing business consulting. And now all of a sudden, I spent most of my days crying and retelling my story, crying some more, telling my story. And then all of a sudden, I wanted to help the homeless. Out of nowhere, the, lo the Lord just said to go do that. I gave up my job. I had no money and still don't have any money. but. I left it all behind, and the only way that I know that this really happened to me is because now, six years later, my life's different. Oh, so, mm -hmm. uh, It's amazing you say, you talked about what you gave up, excuse me, mm -hmm. and how we say it time and time again, you know, 
you may not have all of your wants, but God will supply all of your needs. And six years later, you know, you're still able to do what he called you to do. I still have clothes and yeah. my needs yeah. are being met. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so is that the gray screen? Yes. Um, when, when I got the okay to start our, our little group in Los Angeles, um, we came up with this logo. So it has the gray screen and it has the brilliant white cross uh, that I saw that Jesus came down off of. Mm -hmm. So kind of both of those are there. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's something. Now your ministry, you, you, you not only um, help out homeless people, you know, because we have a lot of people that say, you know, God told me to go help the homeless. What's different about what God instructed you to do? Yeah, we're a little different. Uh, we go out to the homeless that are isolated. Um, predominantly, they're the type of homeless person that probably has severe addiction or severe uh, uh, mental illness. And because of that, they tend to isolate and live either in a forest or in a riverbed or river bottom area, or they may also live around railroad tracks in um, little coves and hideouts. And sometimes uh, they'll live under bridges in, in big cities like Los Angeles. So we kind of spend time Almost like what Jesus did, he said, if he had the, the 99, he would still go out and try to find the one. So we try to go out. We know that the 99 probably get rescue mission and they probably get other services, mm -hmm. but we try to go out and find the ones that nobody calls on them, nobody knows that they're alive. And when they die, nobody will know that they're dead. Uh, we try to find the, the poorest of the poor. And once we establish a relationship with them, which we've been doing now for about six, seven years, then we know they're there. We know their hideout. So we then supply blankets and water and food and spiritual supplies and Bibles. We do that on a monthly basis. So we're kind of like dominoes we deliver. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I bet you the foods you serve is better than the food they yeah. get from Domino's, huh? It's blessed, yeah. Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. Yes. And so in, in, your, in, in your book, Proof of the Afterlife, the conversation continues. You go into your experience yeah. uh, that you had. And uh, how will this book bless someone? Well, I've heard all kinds of people remark about the book. The book's been out about a year now, and usually what I hear the most is that it gives hope. Okay. Uh, you may, when you read the book, um, a person may not agree with everything they read, but that's natural. Uh, they get any book, we're not gonna agree with totally everything. Mm -hmm. But the important thing that the book does is that it offers uh, hope to the person because there's parts of my book that actually uh, demonstrate, like when I was in Los Angeles, my first days helping the homeless, I was a volunteer. The, bo the boss that hired me was a young woman, Angelina, and my first day of work, she shouts in my room, Jim, Jim, and my name's Gary. Uh -huh. And so at the end of this, I just said, for two days, why are you doing this to me? She said, oh, didn't I tell you? She said, I'm a mystic. And she's a Christian mystic. And she says, she goes, there's a man in your office that I can see, and his name is Jim. She says, who's Jim and who has died in your family? Well, she has no idea that two weeks earlier, I saw my father who had died three years earlier, that I had seen him in the, in the night. He had appeared to me. So the strangest thing is I'm working in this situation where only I know what had happened to me two weeks earlier. And my dad had been put on my heart to think about him and forgive him. Mm -hmm. And now she comes to me and she says, there's the man, Jim, and who is he? And I said, well, my dad had just died. She said, no, it's your dad. He's, he's here and he wants to know where this love's coming from, why you're helping the homeless. He's, he's curious about you and he wants to get to know you a little better. I said, well, that's good. I said, because he didn't do that very well when he was alive. <laughs> but it's crazy stuff like this that happened. And you know, people may read that in the book, say, well, I don't know if I really believe stuff like that. But the great thing is, is, that, is that ultimately it's, it's a book of hope, I guess. Mm -hmm. A yeah. book of hope. Book of hope. And, and, and you're trying to bring hope to the homeless. Yeah where they, they really, really need it. We're, you know, 
Um, people will say sometimes, um, I, you know, are you sure that's, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I, I've seen white lights. And, you know, you may have some skeptics. Oh, yeah. Um, but we know that this is something that you went through. Yeah. Uh, how have you handled that? It's, uh, it's comforting as I read the Bible stories now, the ones I grew up with as a kid and mm -hmm. we know so well, but now they make more sense to wow. me, like, this, like the, the, the persecution that, that Job went through and um, the persecution that um, Isaiah went through when he delivered his word from the Lord. And, uh, and then also in modern times, um, Martin Luther King and other people who had seen and been given um, revelation or vision from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And persecution always comes with this territory. And I thought after my near-death experience, you know, people would give me a hug and they'd say, oh, tell me all about it. But it's not always like that. Mm -hmm. there, there's, some, there's some people that, that don't want to know and uh, they'll, they'll do what you'll say, they'll be devil's advocate, and they'll say, oh, that, that never happened to you, uh, the, uh, you're a fake, or that kind of thing. So uh, I'm, I, I'm prepared for it. It doesn't make it any easier to live with that kind of persecution. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's a gift, because it makes me feel more of what Jesus went through when the high priests and the scribes and the Pharisees rejected him. And I think I have a better appreciation mm -hmm. for the torment that he that he went through uh, on, on such a greater level than what we go through mm -hmm. for our testimony of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of exciting in, in that respect. Um, I, I feel like people that have near-death experiences, which they say now uh, because of our medicine advancements, more and more people are having them. Um, they say about five to eight percent of Americans have had valid near-death experiences. So there's more and more of us out here now. And I, I feel like that we're kind of being sent back with a message. We're coming back to Americans and we're, we're trying to say, hey, God is real. Live your life differently. Uh, think about him. Acknowledge him in your daily life. Pray to him every day. Talk to him in your car. We sp as Americans, we spend a lot of time in our cars. And, and what a wonderful time in our cars to turn off the radio, turn off the cell phone, and realize God's real. Talk to him in the car, get some prayer time in. Um, God, God loves us all so much is the message that I feel like he's given me to come back and that he's real and he's waiting for us. Wow. Wow. You know, you've said some key things in there to where you really feel that it, that could be nothing but God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about things every day, but, you know, just how you were saying, you know, we do so much. You know, you're in your car. Just shut everything off. You could pray to me while you're in your car. Don't close your eyes while you're driving, but you can pray <laughs> to God while, you know, you're in your car and, yeah. and, and, and doing those things. And, and just a couple of key words that you made it really simple. And I think God is really trying to get our, uh, the people to, to understand the simplicity of his word. Yes. You know. Amen. One of the things that I wanted to say was that it doesn't matter if anybody else ever believes it or not. Mm -hmm. um, they can try to mock, mm -hmm. you know, your experience or not. But what holds true and fast is what you believe. Yes. And how that experience has changed your life. But, you know, the funny thing is on the same question is since the near death experience, People that don't know me began to teach me that what happened to me was real. And from those days following the near death, a stop at the grocery store or a stop at the pharmacy at CVS or wherever I went, the person at the cash register, even to this very day, sometimes they'll just look at me and sometimes they'll say, are you okay? Are you what are you thinking about? They have this kind of like strange reaction to me that, they, that I've noticed that they don't do to other customers. Mm -hmm. And it was much more profound 
in the first one or two years after the near death, perfect strangers were always saying something to me of that effect. And so it, it began to occur to me that they were seeing something. Um, they say, you, you have so much peace, you just look different. Um, and I said, well, well, thank you for that, you know. But perfect strangers doing this. Two or three days ago, before I got on the flight here, I was coming out of the front of the grocery store, a lady who I never met in my life, I'm walking out the front door, she runs up to me, taps me on the floor, she says, don't, don't leave yet. She said, sir, she said, I see an angel standing behind you. She said, the angel's nine feet tall. I didn't know where to go with that. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. she doesn't know my story. She doesn't know me from Adam. Mm -hmm. And yet God gave her some type of insight that night that almost I think it was for her, mm -hmm. maybe more than it was for me. Right. I, I don't know why he gave her the ability to see that and why she exercised her faith to talk to me when she probably could have thought I would have thought she was crazy or something. You know? mm -hmm. So these kinds of strange things happen, and for me, they, they tend to really validate that God is real, that this really happened to me, and that as the Father told me when I was with him that he wants duty and responsibility from his children, that I now just feel like, okay, I'm here doing my duty, I'm doing my responsibility, and I hope others get it. Mm -hmm. So with, with that being said, and having your, the experience you had with God, how has that helped you out in the ministry field? It's, um, you know, it's really connected me more with the gift of being with the homeless, because uh, as we all know, Jesus was homeless in the last three years of his life. And being around the homeless has, uh, has actually heightened a greater appreciation for the Lord, because you know we often spend a good part of our Christian lives trying to figure out from teenagers when we first really get into the Lord in our lives, is, is he real and how real is he? And, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get our arms around this man Jesus even though we grow up with him and we try to profess him. But the homeless and the call to serve the homeless has really helped in that regard knowing that he himself was homeless, I get to see the life that they live, mm -hmm. and now I can see a little bit more of the life he lived. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the complete uh, rejection of, of everything. The homeless have left everything, and of course the Bible tells us Jesus left everything in heaven, and he gave up everything, all his riches, mm -hmm. uh, so that he could come here and be one like us. So when I see the homeless, you, in a way they, they open my eyes to being with the Lord. And I think on one or two times, I think the Lord appeared to us in the form of a homeless person under the bridges because after we served him, we looked around and he was gone. Mm. So we kind of suspect that from time to time, um, he may actually uh, be there among the homeless. And we've talked to homeless and they've witnessed Christ being among them. One man said that, uh, he was so tattered and worn, this guy, that his uh, foot and his leg was operated on from bruises and infection, and we saw how bad it was. And he said, oh yes, he says, sometimes Christ appears to me, and he says, I don't walk, uh, Christ carries me. Mm. Wow. That's interesting. Wow. And you, you can't, you just can't question that because you never know yeah. Yeah. what actually has happened and yeah. and 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 God works in so many different ways and he does what he does to each of us individually based upon our faith yes. based upon where we are um and of course with him. you know the psalm says uh the psalmist David says he's with the crushed and the broken mm -hmm. And so the psalmist David, he knew that for certain, mm -hmm. that God's always on the side mm -hmm. of the crushed and the broken. Mm -hmm. So when I hear this homeless man who's all tattered and blistered and mm -hmm. broken say that, oh yeah, Jesus picks me up and holds me and helps me to walk mm -hmm. sometimes. He goes, I tend to believe the guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We uh, have about a minute left. Um, how could people find out more about um, you, your experience, your ministry, and this book. Oh, thank you very much. Well, we, 
we do have proof of the afterlife, thanks be to God, in all Barnes & Noble stores okay. and Amazon.com. And we thank the Barnes & Noble and Amazon people for that, for putting the book everywhere, which is a hard thing to do nowadays because space is limited. Um, but we also recommend that they pick up a copy right from us directly. It kind of helps our homeless ministry with a few extra dollars. And uh, directly would be proofoftheafterlife.com. Okay proofoftheafterlife.com. How could people find out more about your ministry serving uh, of, fa of the Father's Mercy? Yeah, the Servants of the Father Mercy, our website, it's servantsofthefather.org. Okay. Servantsofthefather.org. If they'd like to know a little bit more about what we do with the homeless. Okay. okay. Out there in California where uh, um, there's a lot of things going on. You're out there doing the work of the Lord. and 90,000 homeless in L.A. Wow. Just in L.A. County, 90,000. And nationwide, we're about uh, 3.5 million. Homeless. How many people were homeless? Mm -hmm. Six. We're, we're, the homeless are the sixth largest city in the United States, if you put them all together. Wow. The sixth largest city. Mm -hmm. mm. That's something. And we're praying that that changes yeah. and that those statistics, those numbers will drop. And, and if you feel God leading you to work with the homeless ministry, not ne just necessarily with Brother Gary, but right where you are, do that. And in doing so, we want to thank Brother Gary for being here thank you. tonight. We really appreciate you and we thank God for you. Right now, we're going to take you to the heartbeat of Atlanta Live. We're going to take you to the prayer room.